Hello everyone. Have you ever wondered why the same person who helps an elderly stranger cross the street can also cut someone off in traffic and feel completely justified about it? Or why good people sometimes make terrible decisions that they later regret? What if I told you that every single action you take, from the kindest gesture to the most selfish moment, could be explained by science? Welcome back to English as Fluent, where we break down life-changing books so you can read less and learn more in fluent English. Today, we're diving into Behave by Robert Sapolsky, and I have to tell you, this book completely transformed how I see human nature. This isn't just another psychology book. It's a complete roadmap to understanding why humans do what they do, from the split-second neural firings in your brain to the cultural forces that shaped your ancestors thousands of years ago. After reading this book, you'll develop what I like to call behavioral x-ray vision, the superpower to see beneath the surface of every human action and understand the incredible complexity behind even the simplest decisions. You'll never look at conflict, cooperation, or even your own choices the same way again. This knowledge will make you more compassionate, more strategic in your relationships, and frankly, more human. Lesson by Lesson Breakdown Chapter 1. The Behavior Itself Let's start with the foundation. Sapolsky asks us to imagine watching someone's behavior for just one second. Maybe you see someone helping a homeless person, or maybe you witness a road rage incident. In that single moment, what you're seeing is the end result of an incredibly complex chain of events. Think about the last time you got angry at someone. Maybe it was your colleague who interrupted you during a meeting. In that moment, you might have snapped at them, or maybe you held it in and gave them the cold shoulder. But here's what Sapolsky wants you to understand. That reaction wasn't just you being you. It was the result of your neurons firing, hormones flooding your system, memories from similar situations, and even evolutionary programming from our ancestors. I remember once getting frustrated with a friend who was always late. I used to think they just don't respect my time, but after understanding this book, I realized there were layers upon layers influencing both their behavior and my reaction. This shift in perspective changed everything about how I handle conflict. Chapter 2. One Second Before the Neurobiology Now, let's zoom into what happens in your brain one second before that behavior occurs. This is where it gets fascinating. Sapolsky explains that different parts of your brain are literally having a conversation, and sometimes they're arguing with each other. Your amygdala, think of it as your brain's alarm system might be screaming, danger, react now, while your frontal cortex, your rational thinking center, is trying to say, wait, let's think about this logically. The winner of this internal battle determines what you do next. Here's a relatable example. Imagine you're in a heated discussion on social media. Someone posts something you completely disagree with. Your amygdala fires up immediately. You feel that rush of indignation. But if your frontal cortex is strong enough, it might stop you from typing that angry response and instead help you choose a more measured reply, or maybe even just scroll past. The incredible thing is this entire neurological war happens in milliseconds, and most of the time, you're not even aware it's occurring. Chapter 3. Seconds to Minutes Before the Role of Hormones But the story doesn't end with neurons. Let's step back a few minutes before the behavior and look at your hormones. Sapolsky introduces us to some fascinating characters in your endocrine system. Testosterone, for instance, isn't just about aggression like many people think. It's more about seeking and maintaining status. So when someone cuts in line in front of you, the testosterone surge isn't necessarily making you want to fight. It's making you want to maintain your position in the social hierarchy. Then there's cortisol your stress hormone. If you've had a particularly stressful week at work, your cortisol levels are elevated, making you more likely to react strongly to minor irritations. Ever notice how small things bother you more when you're already stressed? That's cortisol at work. I experienced this firsthand during a particularly demanding project at work. I found myself getting annoyed at things that normally wouldn't bother me at all, like my partner leaving dishes in the sink. Understanding that my elevated stress hormones were influencing my reactions helped me recognize when I needed to step back and reset. 
Chapter 4. Hours to Days Before Neuroplasticity Here's where the story gets even more interesting. Hours to days before your behavior, your brain is actually reshaping itself based on your experiences. This is called neuroplasticity, and it's one of the most hopeful concepts in the entire book. Sapolsky explains that every experience you have literally changes your brain structure. If you practice meditation regularly, you're strengthening the neural pathways associated with calm focus. If you frequently engage in arguments on social media, you're strengthening pathways associated with conflict and defensiveness. Think about someone in your life who seems naturally calm and patient. Chances are they've spent years, whether consciously or not, reinforcing neural pathways that support those behaviors. The amazing news is that you can do this too. Your brain is constantly rewiring itself based on what you repeatedly do and think. Chapter 5. Weeks to Months Before Learning and Memory Zooming out further, we need to consider what you've learned in recent weeks and months. Sapolsky explores how our brains are constantly updating their threat detection and reward systems based on recent experiences. If you've recently had a bad experience with a particular type of situation, maybe a difficult conversation with your boss, your brain files this away and influences how you approach similar situations in the future. This isn't conscious. It's your brain trying to protect you and help you succeed. For example, if you gave a presentation that didn't go well a few months ago, your brain might have learned to associate presentations with stress and potential failure. So the next time you're asked to present, your stress response kicks in before you even start preparing. Understanding this helped me realize why I was feeling anxious about situations that rationally I knew I could handle. Chapter 6, Adolescence and Early Adulthood. Here's something that will change how you see every young person in your life. The human brain doesn't fully mature until around age 25. Specifically, the frontal cortex, that rational, impulse-controlling part we talked about earlier, is the last part to develop. This means that teenager who made a series of questionable decisions wasn't just being rebellious. Their brain literally wasn't equipped with a fully functioning brake system yet. Sapolsky explains that adolescents have all the emotional intensity and physical capability of adults, but with less impulse control and less ability to consider long-term consequences. I wish I had understood this when I was judging my younger cousin for some of his choices in college. Knowing that his brain was still developing would have made me much more patient and supportive rather than critical. Chapter 7. Childhood and Before The influences on our behavior reach back even further into childhood. The experiences you had in your first few years of life literally shaped how your brain developed. Children who experience consistent love and security develop different neural patterns than those who experience stress or neglect. But here's what's remarkable. Sapolsky emphasizes that this isn't about blame or making excuses. It's about understanding. When you understand that someone's childhood experiences influence their brain development, you can respond with compassion rather than judgment. Think about that colleague who seems to overreact to criticism. Instead of labeling them as too sensitive, you might recognize that their brain learned early on that criticism could signal danger or rejection. This understanding doesn't excuse inappropriate behavior, but it helps you respond more effectively and humanely. Chapter 8. Genetics and Evolution Now we go even deeper to your genes and evolutionary history. Sapolsky explores how certain behavioral tendencies are influenced by genetic variations. Some people are genetically predisposed to be more sensitive to social rejection, others to be more adventurous or more cautious. But here's the crucial point. Genes are not destiny. They're more like volume controls on different aspects of your personality. Having a genetic predisposition toward anxiety doesn't mean you're doomed to be anxious forever. It just means you might need to work a bit harder to develop calm confidence. From an evolutionary perspective, many of our seemingly irrational behaviors make perfect sense. That tendency to gossip, it helped our ancestors form social alliances that were crucial for survival. That immediate distrust of people who look different from us? Unfortunately, it was once adaptive for detecting potential threats from other tribes. 
Understanding these evolutionary influences doesn't justify prejudice or harmful behavior, but it helps us recognize these impulses for what they are, ancient programming that we can choose to override with conscious effort. Chapter 9. Culture and Context The environment and culture you grew up in profoundly shape your behavior. Sapolsky shows how the same genetic predisposition can lead to completely different outcomes depending on cultural context. For instance, cultures that emphasize honor and reputation might see behaviors that other cultures would consider aggressive or unnecessary. Neither is right or wrong. They're adaptations to different social environments. I found this particularly relevant when working with international colleagues. Behaviors that seemed rude or pushy to me were actually expressions of directness and efficiency in their cultural context. Understanding this cultural layer of behavior helped me communicate much more effectively across cultural boundaries. Chapter 10. The Intersection of Multiple Influences Here's where Sapolsky brings it all together beautifully. Every behavior you observe is the result of all these influences intersecting at once. Neurons and hormones, recent experiences and childhood memories, genetic tendencies and cultural programming, all colliding in a complex dance. This means that judging someone based on a single action is like trying to understand a symphony by listening to just one note. You need to understand the entire orchestra, the biological, psychological, and social instruments all playing together. Chapter 11, Morality and the Brain. One of the most fascinating sections explores how our sense of right and wrong actually develops in the brain. Sapolsky shows that moral reasoning isn't just abstract philosophy. It involves specific neural circuits that can be measured and studied. Different people literally have different patterns of moral reasoning, partly based on brain structure and partly based on experience. Some people's brains prioritize fairness and individual rights, while others prioritize loyalty and group harmony. Neither approach is inherently better. There are different moral frameworks that can lead to different conclusions about the same situation. This helped me understand why people I respect can come to completely different conclusions about ethical issues. We're not just disagreeing about facts. We might be using different moral reasoning systems entirely. Chapter 12. The Neuroscience of Empathy Empathy, it turns out, is far more complex than just caring about others. Sapolsky breaks down different types of empathy. Emotional empathy, where you actually feel what others feel, and cognitive empathy, where you understand what others feel without necessarily feeling it yourself. Both types involve different brain circuits and can be strengthened with practice. This is incredibly hopeful because it means that becoming more empathetic isn't just about being a good person. It's about training your brain, just like training a muscle. I started practicing what Sapolsky calls perspective-taking exercises, deliberately trying to understand situations from other people's viewpoints. Over time, I noticed that conflicts in my personal and professional life became much easier to resolve because I could genuinely see where others were coming from. Chapter 13, Aggression and Violence. Perhaps the most important chapter for our current world. Sapolsky explores the roots of aggression and violence. The key insight is that aggression isn't one thing. It's many different things that look similar on the surface, but have completely different underlying causes. There's reactive aggression, the heat of the moment response to threat or frustration. There's instrumental aggression, using aggression as a tool to achieve a goal. There's even what he calls righteous aggression, violence committed in service of moral principles. Understanding these distinctions is crucial because they require different responses. You can't solve all forms of aggression with the same approach. Some require better emotional regulation skills. Others require addressing underlying needs, and still others require challenging belief systems. Chapter 14, Hierarchy and Status. Humans are incredibly sensitive to social hierarchy, often without realizing it. Sapolsky shows how much of our behavior is driven by our position in various social hierarchies and our attempts to maintain or improve that position. This isn't necessarily about money or formal power. It could be about being respected in your friend group, being
being seen as competent at work, or being valued in your family. These status concerns influence everything from how we dress, to how we argue, to how we help others. Recognizing when status concerns are driving behavior, both in yourself and others, can be incredibly liberating. Sometimes what looks like stubbornness is actually someone trying to save face. Understanding this allows you to find solutions that meet everyone's real needs. Chapter 15, Us Versus Them. One of the most sobering sections of the book explores how quickly and easily humans form in-groups and out-groups. Sapolsky presents research showing that people can be made to show favoritism toward their group and suspicion toward others based on completely arbitrary distinctions, like which color shirt they're wearing or which team they're randomly assigned to. This tendency served our ancestors well when group loyalty meant survival. But in our interconnected world, it can lead to prejudice and conflict. The good news is that understanding this tendency is the first step to overcoming it. Sapolsky shows that we can expand our definition of us to include larger and larger groups. The person you see as fundamentally different from you probably shares more similarities than differences. You both want safety, connection, purpose, and respect. So what's the key transformation this book offers? It's the shift from judgment to understanding. Instead of asking, why did they do that terrible thing? You start asking what complex web of influences led to this behavior. Instead of writing people off as good or bad, you start seeing them as complex beings shaped by biology, experience, and circumstance just like you. This doesn't mean excusing harmful behavior or abandoning personal responsibility. It means responding more effectively, with both compassion and wisdom. When you understand the true complexity behind human behavior, you become better at helping people change, better at protecting yourself from harm, and better at creating the kind of world you want to live in. Now I want to hear from you. Which aspect of human behavior from this book surprised you the most? Was it learning about the teenage brain, understanding the role of hormones, or maybe discovering how quickly we form us versus them thinking? Share your thoughts in the comments below. And speaking of the comments, I'd love your suggestions for the next book we should cover here on English is Fluent. What book has been sitting on your shelf, waiting to be understood? What topic are you curious about? Let me know, and it might become our next deep dive together. If this video helped you understand human behavior in a new way, please give it a thumbs up. It really helps other people discover these ideas. And if you want more life-changing book summaries delivered in fluent English, hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you never miss our latest content. Remember, here at English is Fluent, we believe you can read less and learn more in fluent English. Until next time, keep learning, keep growing, and keep being wonderfully complexity human. See you in the next video.